And in John chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And look if you would at verse 6. And this he said to do what? <laughs> to prove him. One translation says this he said to test him. The Greek word actually means this he said to expose him. To expose him. For he himself knew already what he was going to do. But if you would go back to verse 1, and we're going to quickly go through verse 1, then move to verse 2. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Verse 2, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. But when you come to verse 2, this verse is absolutely jam-packed in the Greek language. For example, you're reading the King James Version says, a great multitude. What you have in Greek is not needed unless you're really trying to dramatize a point. The word multitude is the Greek word oklus. The word oklus by itself already describes a massive multitude. But if you connect the word polus to it, the word polus becomes a modifier, which means this is not just a massive multitude. This is a massive, massive, massive multitude which is following Jesus. And in fact, it is the largest multitude that has followed him up until this point in his ministry. And the Bible says they followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And when the Bible says they followed, the Greek tense literally means they followed and followed and followed and followed and followed and followed and, followed and kept on habitually following and following and following and following. It is the same tense you would use to describe a drug addict who has to have another fix. These people had had a taste of the miraculous power of God, and now they wanted to be wherever Jesus was because that's where the power of God was being manifested. So they habitually followed and followed and followed and followed, which means if Jesus turned north, the whole multitude turned north. If Jesus turned west, the whole multitude turned west. And every day, the multitude was growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they were following because, what does it say? They saw. The word saw in Greek agrees with the word follow, which means you would translate the verse and a great massive multitude kept on following and following and following and following and following him because they kept on seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. But there's something else very important. The word see that is used here is their same Greek word from which we get the word for theater. Which means when Jesus' ministry began in the Galilee, it was the best theatrical presentation which had ever been performed among those people. And everyone wanted to show up for every part of the show. No one wanted to miss one thing that was happening. And furthermore, the verse says, his miracles which he did, the word did, is a translation of the Greek word poieo. This is very important. The word poieo is where you get the word for a poem. It's where you get the word for a poet. It carries somebody who has a creative flair or a creative ability. And by using this word poieo, here translated as the word did, it tells us when Jesus' ministry was taking place in Galilee, Jesus didn't just do normal miracles like the healing of a headache or someone's blood pressure, but the word poieo means Jesus was literally releasing creative power, creating limbs where there had been no limbs, creating eyes where there had been no eyes. And when the people saw this, they followed and followed and followed and followed and followed him. Now, I just have to make a point that I believe is so important. When you read the four Gospels, it does not give us a record of everything that Jesus did. It is just a snapshot. When you come to John chapter 21, verse 25, John ends the book of John by saying, if it were possible, and when you read this in the Greek, you understand it's not possible. It literally means if it were possible, of course it's not. 
But let's just say it were possible to write down everything that Jesus did. If we could write down everything that Jesus did, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Well, listen to this. If you chronologically put together the life of Jesus, which is conveyed to us in the four gospels, beginning from his birth, beginning from his birth to his ascension, how many days of Jesus' life do you think are recorded in the gospels? I didn't say how many years, how many explicit days of his life are recorded in the gospels? Have you ever thought about that question? I can give you the answer. <laughs> at a minimum, 20. At a maximum, 52. All scholars agree we only have a record of 20 to 52 days of Jesus' life out of three and a half years of ministry. It's just a snapshot. And furthermore, we don't even have one complete record of one entire day. All we have are just little snapshots, just little pictures of moments in his days. And it took four gospels to record those little moments, which explains why John said, if it were possible, of course it's not, but if it were, if we really could write down everything that he did, the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. So the gospels do not contain everything that Jesus did. In addition to what we read about in the gospels, Jesus released poieo, creative power, creating limbs where there had been no limbs, creating eyes where there had been no eyes. And in fact, when you look at verse two, it continues to say the miracles which he did on, on them that were diseased. The word on is the Greek word epi. It describes a descending force. In this case, it describes an invasion of divine miraculous power that came into the Galilee. It was like a divine occupying force that came into the whole region through Jesus' ministry. And now for days, the crowd is following and following and following and following and following because they keep on seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing his miracles, which he's miraculously creating upon them that are diseased. Then if you would look at the next verse, the next verse says, are you with me? All right, let me go to my Bible. The next verse says, and Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Verse 4, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. This event, which we are reading about in John chapter 6, happened very near to the city of Capernaum. The city of Capernaum was the city of Jesus. Jesus had been rejected by Nazareth, and when Jesus left Nazareth, he strategically chose the city of Capernaum. Why did Jesus choose the city of Capernaum? God does nothing accidentally. God is very strategic in everything that he does. The city of Capernaum was very strategic for the ministry of Jesus. First of all, it was the largest city on the Sea of Galilee. It was a very large port. It was a very rich, rich city. In fact, it was so rich, they had the finest synagogue in that entire region. There was a large attachment of Roman soldiers who lived in Capernaum. There were intellectuals who lived in Capernaum. Capernaum was on the border, and it was a city where all the people had to pass through, and they had to pay taxes as they entered into Israel when they came to Capernaum, and it was a city where they kept all the money that was collected from taxes in the whole of Galilee, and that's why Jesus met Matthew there. So when Jesus came to the city of Capernaum, he chose a city that was well-situated, a city that was filled with an international population. There were military forces there. There were rich people there. And there was something else very important about Capernaum. Right along the side of Capernaum was a very important road, which was called the Via Maris. The Via Maris began in the city of Damascus. It came all the way down by the city of Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee, went all the way down to Jerusalem, and then turned and went to the city of Cairo. 
So if you were in Cairo and you wanted to go to Damascus, you had to take that road, which was the Via Maris. Or if you were in Damascus and you wanted to go south to Cairo, you had to take that road, which meant there was a constant flow of traffic all the time passing right by the city of Capernaum, which means without ever leaving home, Jesus was able to touch an international community. He didn't have to go to the people because the people were coming to him all the time. And in fact, so many people were coming to Jesus in Capernaum that even during Jesus' lifetime, it became known as the city of Jesus. Jesus was the biggest tourist attraction in the city of Capernaum. People were coming and coming and coming. In fact, if you do a study, I think you'll be quite surprised to see the majority of miracles which Jesus performed occurred in Capernaum or right around the city of Capernaum. And on this particular day, Jesus somehow has separated from the multitude and he and his disciples have gone into the top of a mountain. The Bible says there they sat down. When you read this in the Greek, it actually says they reclined. You're going to read later in the text that there was much grass in the place. It was a beautiful place. And from the top of that mountain, they could look right down to the Sea of Galilee. They could look right across Galilee at the other side of the lake. And they could see down at the bottom of the hill the Via Maris, which was the highway which went from Damascus all the way to the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us very specifically that the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Well, why does the Holy Spirit tell us that? Because at the time of Passover, everyone made a pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem. If you lived in the north of Israel, the Passover was so important, you would pack up your kids everyone in your household. It became a family tradition. Everyone headed to the city of Jerusalem. To tell you how many people came to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, Jerusalem typically was a city of less than 50,000 people. But at the time of Passover, more than 1 million people could come to the city of Jerusalem. So now Jesus is on the top of his mountain and suddenly he lifts up his eyes he hears a noise or there's some kind of a commotion and he looks and the Bible says he saw a great multitude come unto him. The word saw is the Greek word theomai. It's another word for the drama or for a theater, which means a whole drama was unfolding in front of Jesus. And Jesus saw a great multitude. In Greek, it is again, oculus pulis, this modifier, which means not just a multitude, but a massive, massive, massive multitude has now left the highway. They're walking up the side of the hill, and Jesus knew they were coming toward him. The word toward in Greek is the word pros, which means directly toward him. He knew they were not coming to see any of the other apostles. They were all headed directly toward him. And look what the Bible says next. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw, again, the Greek word theomai, it was like a drama that was unfolding. Saw a great multitude, a massive, massive multitude coming directly toward him. He saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? The word buy is a translation of the Greek word agarazo. It's really the word for a shop or for a market. If you want to translate this correctly, Jesus said, hey, are there any shops up here? Are there any stores up here where we can buy some bread to feed these folks? And of course, there was not. It was a remote place. There were no shops. There were no stores. But the next verse says, and this he said to do what? Prove him. This he said to prove him, for he himself knew already what he was going to do, which means Jesus didn't ask the question to get information. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Jesus asked the question for the one that he was speaking to, to prove him. And the word prove that is used here is the Greek word perazo, which means to test something to find out if it is defective. To find out if it is defective. To expose, to uncover, to reveal. Now, you would think that after these disciples had walked with Jesus and had worked with Jesus in his great miraculous healing ministry, they had seen him walk on water, raise the dead, do everything. After everything they have seen Jesus do, 
you would think they would quickly rush to faith and say, God, we don't know how you're going to do this. Jesus, we don't know what kind of miracle you're going to perform, but after everything else we've already seen you do in our lives, we know, Lord, you have this under control. Well, think about it. If the multitudes were following and following and following and following and following because they were seen and seen and seen and seen and seen, and the multitude had seen this power from a distance, how much more had these disciples seen and felt the power of God as they worked alongside of Jesus and stood at his side when Jesus' power was released? They had felt the anointing. They had seen the results of his power. They had seen it all. But they had never seen him multiply food. And now Jesus was asking them a question to find out really where were they in their faith. And the purpose of this was to bring them up a level, to bring them up a level. God's always wanting to bring us up a level in our understanding. And the Bible says Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Joel, would you come up here? I need your help. The word penny worth in Greek is the word denarius. What I have in my hand is a real denarius from the first century. This is a denarius from the time of Hadrian. Hadrian was a Christian killer, but this really is a first century denarius. If you worked one entire day, at the end of the day, you were paid one denarius, which means when he said, Lord, if we were able to accumulate 200 penny worth of bread or 200 denarius, it was really the equivalent of saying, Lord, if we were able to accumulate 200 days of income, even 200 days of income would not be enough to buy bread that every one of them may take a little. The word little in Greek means a fragment. That would not even be enough money to buy crumbs for a crowd this big. Now, just for fun, do you have some of my little gifts? You know, you know we have come from the East bearing gifts. <laughs> Isn't that what the wise men did? So I have brought gifts just for fun. I have brought in some denarius to give away. This is a real first century denarius, and it is graded extra fine. So it is for an extra fine man by the name of Brother Kenneth Copeland. This is for you, Brother Copeland. I have another real first century denarius graded extra fine, which is for Mr. George Pearson. These are real denarius. There you have a Hadrian. Every time you look at that, you need to think of God using wicked men. Hadrian was a Christian killer, but he's the one who built all the roads across the Roman Empire, which gospel preachers traveled on to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. God is in charge even when it looks like evil men are in charge. Here we have a denarius of Valerian, a real Roman emperor. Valerian was so wicked that when he was arrested by the Persians and was taken as a prisoner of war, they used him as a stool to stand on to get on horses. And that's for you, Brother Keith. That's a, that's a real... Another Valerian, there you go, brother. Very fine. That's a good quality for a good man. Okay, Joel, give me all the rest of those. Oh, I have them in my pocket. I brought all kinds of denarius just for fun. Who else comes to preach and brings relics? Here you go, Dennis. That's a Hadrian from the first century. Sister Billy, that's a Hadrian from the first century. Terry, would you like to have a Hadrian from the first century? Every time you look at it, think how God is in charge. There you go, brother. But, thank you, Joel. If you worked an entire day, at the end of the day, you were paid one denarius. So if you had 200 of those, that was 200 days of wages. So when he said, Lord, 200 penny worth of bread, the Greek literally says 200 denarius is not sufficient to buy crumbs to feed a multitude this big. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment how big was the multitude. Rather than rush to faith, rather than say, Lord, we don't know how you're going to do this, but we trust you. We know you're going to do this. 
the disciples moved into panic and they began working the crowds looking for food. <laughs> Have any of you ever moved into a mode of panic where you thought you were going to fix your problem by yourself? Now they're working the crowd, walking up inside the, down to the side of the mountain, looking for food. And the Bible finally tells us, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Well, when I was a little boy growing up in church, I was a Baptist. I don't know, did we have any former Baptists here? I was a sunbeam. Did we have any sunbeams here? I was a sunbeam. And I can remember being a sunbeam sitting in my little miniature chair with my legs under the little miniature table. And the teacher brought out a full color illustration from Broadman Press in Nashville. And on the full color illustration was an illustration of a little boy about 12 years old carrying a big basket with five big loaves of bread and two great big fish. And I loved that story because my father was a bass fisherman. I was growing up in a bass boat with my dad. So in my mind, I could imagine these two huge fish and five big loaves of bread. But then one day I pulled out my Greek New Testament to begin to study this verse. <laughs> and I realized there was something very wrong with my imagination. First of all, when the Bible says there is a lad here, it's a translation of the word pice. The word pice does not describe a 12-year-old. It describes a boy about the age of six. However, in this case, it is the word piderion, which is even a younger boy. This is a boy below the age of five. And so I thought, why would a five-year-old be walking around with five big loaves of bread and two big fish? So I better look into this verse to find out what was he really carrying. And the Bible says he had five loaves of bread and two small fish. The word loaf is the Greek word artiros, which describes a loaf, but this is krithinos. The word krithinos describes a barley loaf, which is not a barley loaf of bread at all. It is actually the word for a cracker. It's a barley cracker. Now, it's already a miracle to think you're going to feed thousands of people with five loaves of bread, but to feed them with five crackers, that makes this even a bigger miracle. So then I asked, if that was the size of the cracker, what was the size of the fish? <laughs> and the word fish is a very specific Greek word which describes a small pickled fish so small it will fit on top of the cracker. <laughs> These were crackers and minnows. And that is now why he says, but what are they among so many? When he brought this suggestion to Jesus, when it came out of his mouth, even he realized, this is absurd. What am I doing? <laughs> Bringing such a suggestion to Jesus. Five crackers, two minnows, but what are they among so many? And think about the position that the little boy was in. The little boy was probably about to eat his snack. He was about to put his crackers and his minnow in his lap in his mouth when a stranger said, don't eat that food, we need that food. They pick him up, run him to the top of the hill where he stands in front of a man that he doesn't even know. And he's being asked to give his crackers to a stranger. That's literally what's happening here. And then the verse goes on to say, Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number, about 5,000. 
Well, when you come to the first of this verse, it says, make the men sit down. That word men is the word anthropos. It means people in general. Make all the people sit down. And when you read the other gospels, Jesus got very organized. He told them to sit down by tens, by twenties, by fifties, to sit down by family clans. The disciples saw a crisis. Jesus saw grass. We have to make sure we see what we're supposed to see. Do you see crisis or do you see opportunity? Jesus saw grass. He saw crackers. He saw minnows. It was a beautiful place for a picnic. And Jesus gave the charge, have the people sit down. And they begin to sit down by tens, by twenties, by fifties. And then John adds, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. But now he gets very specific because this word men is the Greek word Andres, which describes the fathers or the heads of households. So there were only fathers, 5,000, heads of households, 5,000. And remember, these were Jews who populated like rabbits because they believed children were a blessing from the Lord. And now they're taking all their families south to the city of Jerusalem for Passover. Every family, the entire family traveling just with heads of households, there are 5,000. So if you add the children, the grandparents, everybody that was traveling, most scholars believe that at a minimum, there was 40,000 people in this crowd. The side of this hill was completely covered as far as the eye could see people. And now the disciples in blind obedience are walking through the crowd knowing, knowing all they have are five crackers and two minnows. But because Jesus has told them to do it, they're walking through the crowd saying, if you'll just take a seat, dinner will be served soon. <laughs> Get out your blankets. Everybody get ready. The meal will be coming soon. They must have been wondering, what are we doing? This is false advertising. We're deceiving people, making them think we have something that we do not have. Brother Copeland, I was thinking about you when I was preparing for this today. All the times God has told you to do something when you did not have the money in the bank to do it. Imagine what staff thinks. My own staff. Back in the early days in the Soviet Union, when we were renting a building, believing God for the money just to buy new carpet for that building, and God spoke to me and told me to buy a building that was going to cost a million dollars cash, and in Russia, you cannot finance anything. My staff probably thought I had lost my mind. But you know, when you have a word from God, you know more than anybody else knows. And obedience brings you everything you need. Obedience is like a magnet. If you'll be obedient, it will attract to you the full provision of God. Jesus knew what they did not know. Now in obedience, they're telling the people, sit down, get ready. Lunch will be served soon. And then look what happened in the next verse. This next verse is so powerful. It says, then Jesus did what? Took the loaves. But there's a problem here. Because the Greek word is alabon. It does not mean to take. It means, listen careful, to receive. Jesus received the loaves. And this is important because Jesus will never take anything from you, but he will receive anything that you give to him. And it also tells us that a surrender took place on the part of the little boy. The little boy surrendered and Jesus received. And Jesus received the loaves. And when he had what? Given thanks. Given thanks is the Greek word eukaristos. The word you describes something wonderful, something just swell, marvelous. The word kerastos is where you get the word charis. Andrew, that's where the name of your school comes from. It's for the word grace. But when you compound charis with the word you, it forms the word eukaristos, which describes somebody who thanks God. It's just freely flowing like grace out of their heart. They're giving well thanks. They're just blessing God and blessing God. So now Jesus is standing there with five loaves, 
two minnows. But because the word eukaristos is used, give thanks. It lets us know Jesus was not looking at what was in his hand. Jesus lifted his face. Jesus lifted his voice. And Jesus moved into a mode of thanksgiving. And as Jesus, you thanked and thanked and thanked and thanked and thanked and thanked and thanked, and thanked, and thanked God, what was in his hands began to multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. And my friend, I want to tell you that when you move into a mode of thanksgiving, it releases the miraculous in your life. Jesus moved into a mode of thanksgiving and what was in his hands? Begin to multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. And he began to distribute, the Bible says, the loaves and the fishes. How much? What does it say? As much as? As much as, somebody tell me. As much as they wanted, as much as they would which means there was no end to the supply. As long as the people wanted more, Jesus would keep giving more. And when you come to the next verse, it tells us how much they ate. And when they were filled, in Greek that's called pluperfect, it means double filled. In other words, they ate like gluttons or they feel like many people feel at the end of Thanksgiving when they have eaten and eaten and eaten and eaten. These people are laying on their sides, holding themselves, saying, why did we eat so much? They were double filled. All of that came from five crackers and two minnows. And I think it's very important because the Bible says they ate as much as they would, which meant the disciples were running all up and down the side of the hill as people were saying, hey, can you please bring me some more of those crackers? Hey, we'd like to have some more of those fish over here. And the disciples are literally just running back and forth, back up to Jesus, Jesus still thanking God. And in the mode of Thanksgiving, the food just continues to be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. They come and say, Jesus, we need some more of that. And notice what did not happen here. Jesus never said, in greats, you ought to be happy with what I've already given you. How much do you want? Jesus did not have a stingy mentality. If they wanted more, he gave more, and he gave more, and he gave more, and he gave more. And friends, I want to make just a small diversion here for a moment. We all like to quote Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Prove me now, herewith says the Lord of hosts, if I will not what? Say it louder. Open the window of heaven and pour out a blessing so big that you do not have room to receive it. We all quote that. One day I decided to do a study on the window of heaven. Do you know that window shows up three times in the Old Testament? Just three times. The first time it shows up is in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. When God put Noah into the ark and shut the door, and the Bible says God opened the window of heaven, and what happened? Rain began pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring, immeasurable rain. So much rain came pouring through that portal that it filled the top of all mountains. The second time the window shows up is in Psalm chapter 78, where the Bible says when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God opened a window in the heavens and poured out Manna, poured out manna. How much manna do you think came pouring through that window every day? Billy, you can research this. I got this out of a wonderful Hebrew rabbinic literature. The rabbis said every morning, every morning, there was enough manna, fresh manna every morning, every morning enough in one single day to feed Israel for 2,000 years. Which means God doesn't think 
in terms of limitations. God made more than they could ever even pick up. It literally rained. And in fact, if you begin to add it all up according to what the rabbis wrote, every morning there was 4,500 tons of manna laying on the ground. And if you multiply that over all the years that it fell, it is 67,500,000 tons of manna. not just little tiny cakes, one here and one there. It's tons and tons and tons and tons. And God was so good. There was an entire generation who grew up in the wilderness thinking that it was normal just to wake up every day and find tons and tons and tons on the bread. That's all life they had ever known. Now you come over to Malachi chapter three and verse 10, where God says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse and see if I won't open a window in heaven. What happened when the window opened in Genesis chapter seven, rain poured and poured and poured until it flooded the earth. In Psalm chapter 78, God poured out tons and tons and tons and tons of manna. And most of us need to renew our thinking because we have led ourselves to believe that if God opens a window in the heavens to pour us out a blessing that we can't receive it, that that means this month we'll be able to get by better than we got by last month. That is not what it means. God wants to abundantly pour, 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 pour. Every time the window opens, abundance comes pouring through that window. So Jesus was not miserly in what he did that day. If they wanted more, they could have more. He just kept multiplying and multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And look at what the Bible says next. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Verse 13. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Well, how many disciples were there? Twelve. How many baskets were there? I wonder what would be the chances that there just happened to be 12 disciples and 12 baskets. That the mystery of that is removed when you understand that this word basket is the very word which was used to describe luggage in the first century. Luggage. This is what you carried your belongings in when you traveled. Jesus said, gather up the fragments that remained. They didn't have anything else, so they just began dumping their suitcases, emptied their suitcases, running up and down the side of the hill, filling their suitcases, their wicker baskets with the pieces that remained. And I want to tell you, friends, when God's abundance pours out, sometimes you just got to use what you have to catch the abundance. They just used what they had. Something else very important The Bible doesn't tell us how long this event took place, but it seems it took place for many hours. And the disciples were the one running, serving, taking, coming back, getting more, delivering here, going there, serving, 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 serving. But at the end of the day, those who served were not forgotten. Jesus blessed those that served. And I want to tell you, the servants in your church, the volunteers in your church that have missed church to work in the nursery or to be an usher or to serve in the parking lot, Jesus has not forgotten about them. Jesus always specially blesses those who serve. But then when you come to verse 14, it says, then those men. What men? It's the disciples. Those men which had seen Jesus raise the dead. They had seen him change water into wine. They had seen him do miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, but they had never seen this. And those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this of the truth is that prophet which should come into the world, which means it brought them up in their understanding. It expanded them in their revelation of who Jesus is. And I want to tell you that this story is very real to me. It's very personal to me. Because in the early days of our ministry, Denise and I were working hard to get established. And those of you that have worked, you all remember what that's like. We traveled across the United States in our car, believing that our ministry would be established. And we were preaching 450 times a year 
back in those days, 450 times a year. God was blessing us. We bought a beautiful home in Tulsa. And somebody asked me to go on a mission trip to the Soviet Union. Well, that time it was still the Soviet Union. I didn't want to go. I really didn't like missionaries. <laughs> I had missionaries in my family. I really didn't like them. It seemed like they had a poverty mentality. I really didn't like missionaries. And because I teach from the Greek, I didn't know how my gift would work overseas with a foreign audience. I really didn't want to go. But they conned me into the trip, and I said yes. <laughs> and when I found myself standing in front of the pulpit on the other side of the world to speak for the first time, I opened my Bible, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, welcome to your new home. I'm standing at a makeshift pulpit in a totally dilapidated auditorium in the Soviet Union filled with about 200 students. Light bulbs are burned out. The walls are cracked. The shops in the city are empty. And the Holy Spirit says, welcome to your new home. That's why I love this story. I can tell you, I didn't rush forward with faith the moment Jesus said that to me. <laughs> Do you know what I was teaching about back in those days? Denise and I traveled in the United States teaching people how to walk in faith and how to obey God. You know, you really never realize where you are in your faith until Jesus asks you to do something new. One question from Jesus will really reveal your level of faith. Easy to say you'll follow him to the ends of the earth when he's never asked you to do that. Oh. For several months, I struggled. I kept thinking if I would ignore what the Holy Spirit had said, it would just go away. But you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit's like the hound dog of heaven. He just follows after you right on your heels, just following. And every day, I would hear the Holy Spirit saying, are you going to obey me? 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 Bob Yandian was my pastor. Bob's right here, and Pastor Bob is such a sensible man. And I said to Denise, I'm going to go see Pastor Bob. Pastor Bob will tell me this is ridiculous. This is not the Lord. And I sat down with Pastor Bob, told him what was on my mind, and he said, you know, Rick, I don't know why, but I really feel this is God. <laughs> I was so sorry I went to see him that day. I wanted him to tell me it was ridiculous so I could abandon the idea. And finally, I said to Denise, all right, this is it. This is it. I'm going to ask our sons what they think. <laughs> and if our sons say they don't want to go, I'm taking it as a clue from heaven that this is not the will of God. Well, here's two of them. Paul, stand up. Paul was eight years old. You think anybody eight years old knows what's the Soviet Union? <laughs> Joel, stand up. Joel's now the tallest, but he was two years old at the time. <laughs> Philip's not here. He'll be here tomorrow, but Philip was six. So I set them on the couch. Denise and I stood in front of them. <laughs> and I said, boys, I need to talk to you about something. <laughs> yes, Daddy. I said, we're thinking about moving to the Soviet Union. Do you know what that means? No, Daddy, no. I said, the Soviet Union is a country 
that doesn't believe in God and they kill Christians. <laughs> Do you understand? I said, yes, daddy. If we move to the Soviet Union, your mother and I could be sent to prison or we could be killed and you will become orphans. <laughs> Am I exaggerating? Do you understand? Yes, daddy. I said, now I want to know. <laughs> what do you think? And Philip, who was six, said, I said, yes, Philip. He said, well, daddy, you got to die sometime. <laughs> We might as well die doing what Jesus asked us to do. <sighs> I felt so trapped everywhere I turned. I was hearing this was the will of God for our lives. You know what's going through my mind? What will happen if I obey God? How are we going to pay our bills? What if we move over there and a revolution takes place? What will happen to us? What will happen to my ministry if I do what Jesus is asking me to do? <laughs> Put yourself in our shoes. It was the Soviet Union at that time. Crazy. You remember the bread lines you used to see on the news? That's what we moved our family into. There was no gas for the car. There was no sugar. There were no eggs. There was no flour. There was no toilet paper. My friends, that is a very serious situation. <laughs> there were no light bulbs. And where there are no light bulbs, there are no candles because people have already purchased all the candles. Bob came over back in those days. Bob, am I telling the truth? It was just unbelievable what we moved our family into. And here we had just bought our house on the golf course one block from Brother Hagen. <laughs> I was so excited about our house and what was happening in our ministry. My books were selling and moving across the world. Now Jesus is asking me to move to the Soviet Union. Oh. But you know what we learned? Jesus won't make you do anything. If I had said no, he would have blessed me. I was teaching the Bible. He would have blessed me. If this little boy had said, Jesus, these are my crackers and I'm going to eat them, you know what? They really were his crackers. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't have held anything against that little boy. In fact, Jesus probably would have patted him on the head and said, enjoy those crackers as they go in your mouth, down your throat, into your stomach, and through you into the toilet. That will be the end of those crackers, but enjoy them for the next few moments. <laughs> Sewage material. <laughs> but if the little boy wanted to eat them, Jesus would have said, that's fine, they're yours. Jesus would have done it another way. And if I had said no, God would have blessed us regardless. Oh, I remember when I made my public announcement, I could have just kicked myself for making that announcement. <laughs> I was in a meeting in Florida. And you know, sometimes when you're in meetings like this, you have a gust of faith. <sighs> and I had a gust of faith found myself standing at the front with a microphone in my hand saying, I'm moving my family to the Soviet Union. And when it came out of my mouth, oh, I thought, what have you done? If you had kept your mouth shut, you could have disobeyed God. Nobody would have ever known you were in disobedience. But now you had to blab and people are going to think you're disobedient or you don't know the voice of God. Trapped. 
Went back to my room, vomited the whole night. <laughs> God didn't make me vomit. I made me vomit. I upset myself so much. Just the idea of what I had committed to do. But guess what? Jesus wasn't going to take us. We had to surrender. How many crackers did the little boy have? Five. Guess how many runners there were? Five. My family was my crackers. I said, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this. But if you want us, here we are. And guess what Jesus did? He received us. And if I look back at what has happened in our life over 30 years, it is impossible to exaggerate what has taken place. The millions of lives that have been touched. If I didn't do anything but broadcast Believer's Voice of Victory for nearly 30 years, that signal going into millions and millions of homes, what if I had said no? That door wouldn't have opened for you. Jesus took us. He multiplied us. And he fed a multitude. And we're just getting started. Amen? Yeah. But my friends, what's in your hands? Does it seem you've got a crisis on your hands? Quit looking at crisis. You need to see grass. It's an opportunity that's in front of you. God is placing an opportunity in front of you. There's green grass. There's breezes. That crisis is an opportunity for God to do something absolutely miraculous in your life. But it depends on your willingness to release what you have into his hands. And if you'll release, he's a receiver. Jesus is a receiver. And you know, here's the thing. That day, the Bible says, then those men, when they saw the miracle which Jesus did, said of a truth, this is that prophet that should come into the world. They had a brand new understanding of Jesus. They saw Jesus do something. It took them up in their faith. They never doubted his ability to do that again because they had experienced that level of power. Every time you have a new experience with Jesus, it takes you up a big notch in your faith and provides a bigger platform for you to take the next step up. So that's what was on my heart today. You know, Brother Copeland, I want to say thank you to you for Victory Channel. Do, have any of you had any idea what that costs? When you announced you were going to do that, I think everyone close was like stunned. Nobody doubts that you know the voice of God. But just naturally, that was such a massive, massive step. And it wasn't just airtime. But you opened the door for all of us to speak to your partners and your friends. It was a gift. So many gifts you gave. And Brother Copeland, I thank you from my heart. I really thank you. And I'm believing God that what you have done is going to be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied back to you. I'm really believing that for you. But Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are Lord of multiplication. And Father, for pastors in this room today that are in building programs, you've asked them to do something beyond their natural ability. Well, Lord, that's good. Then we move into your ability. And Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus to take us up. Take us up. Take us into a new realm. Ask us a question that makes us come a little higher. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to me today.